I've been pretty firm in my assertions that the Emperor is a god. However, no one ever said he had to be a nice one. He was the best guy around. What about the people he murdered? What it's murder? So now, as of my first recording on this, I just finished the End in the Death Volume 2 earlier today, and I really had to knock out my thoughts on this. That being said, everyone stay tuned, there's gonna be a full video about the End in the Death Volume 2, similar to the one I did for the End in the Death Volume 1, where I talk about all the plot points, read a few excerpts, go over my theories, and all that. But that might take a little while, so I'm gonna be covering spoilers from the book in videos like this piecemeal up until the big kahuna drops. So. Let's get this out of the way quickly, and please consider subscribing if you have not already done so, so you don't miss the full video when it comes out. But with all that being said, let's talk about the Emperor, the Dark King, and Starchild. Yeah, see, while everyone is hyper fixated on the Dark King thing from The End of the Death Volume 2, Starchild is what caught my attention. Now for those who don't know, Starchild is actually the first major plot point to ever be introduced in 40k novels, all the way back in the 1990s because the first series of novels called the Inquisition War Books dealt with the idea of Starchild, that being a fragment of the Emperor's empathetic soul that, according to those old books, he ejected from his body in order to be able to defeat Horus so he wouldn't be burdened by empathy or emotion or love for his son, which characters in that series seek to harness to resurrect the Emperor. Now, there's a bunch of other weird plot points attached to the Starchild storyline, and it was dropped by GW. It is considered the first retconned plotline, but it is probably coming back. Now, I could just explain the events of the book as they were, but that's not me. I really need to start cutting into the meat of it and making theories, even if it is a bit of a reach. That being said, let's dive right in. And to kick it off, the Emperor was going to be the Dark King. Now, for those who have read The End in the Death Volume 1, there is one name that comes up ad nauseum, that being the Dark King. On walls it appears, in war cries of the traitor host it appears, demons whisper it and speak of its coming, even books begin to foretell the Dark King, the Dark King. Any tarot card spread anyone plays always ends with the Dark King. And people reasonably assume that's Horus. There is so much power invested with him that when he strikes down his father, it will allow him to ascend to godhood. He will become the fifth god of chaos and it will spell the doom of humanity. The human race will be consumed like the Eldar was, and Horus will rise. However, as the Emperor boards the Vengeful Spirit to stop Horus, alongside his custodians and his sons Sanguinius, Dorn, and Valdor, they're separated, leaving him to fight on alone with a small group of custodians, who do actually turn on him because Horus's power is so great he can seize control of their bodies, even if their minds are not turned against the Emperor. So the Emperor must strike them down before he can summon enough power to burn Horus's influence out of most of them. Bit by bit, he would grind his way forward, and in order to counteract the Horus he would face every step of the way, he would have to take in more and more of the warp to keep himself going and give him the strength to move forward and eventually destroy Horus who was absolutely more powerful than him in his base form, because of Horus' connection to the Chaos Gods. However, he would continue to gorge himself on the power of the warp, to the point where even Malkador could see what he was becoming, that being the Dark King. And we learn this from none other than Azek Araman of all people, because when he enters the Hall of Lang, the Emperor's personal library, if you've seen my shorts, he explains that the Emperor is actually becoming the Dark King, not Horus, because of just how much power he has absorbed, and the fact that the prophecy that Horus would become the Dark King has been thrown out of whack by the fact that time has completely collapsed due to just how much of the warp is bleeding into reality here. And when we finally see the Emperor, it is through the eyes of Olanius Persson and John Grammaticus. Yeah, John Grammaticus is here. And when we see him, it's not what you would expect. When you hear, oh, the Emperor is becoming the Dark King, what are you going to expect? Some shadowy, towering entity with glowing red eyes or what have you. But in reality, it's so much scarier. Because all the Emperor is, is a smooth, large black orb. 
menacing in its presence and bleeding so much power that it has literally burnt out the custodians surrounding it, who couldn't even look at the Emperor as they advanced forward because of how powerful and radiant he was. They are all burnt to a crisp and dead except for one, who was kept alive by the sigil Malkador licked onto his armor, yes, that is what happened, in the End in the Death Volume 1, and who is used as the mouthpiece of the Emperor. His name is Kaikaltus Dusk, and he's a Hateron companion. It is through him that the Emperor speaks to none other than Olanius Pius, the oldest living human in the galaxy, a perpetual who predates him and was his first war master, until they broke ways because the Emperor's desire to control and rush forward put Olanius Pius off so much that he actually stabbed him. Now, there are jokes I could make about this, but I'll save the jokes for the full video when that comes out. However, their conversation boils down to, Emperor, I understand why you're doing this, but you need to understand what you're becoming. No, this is the only way I can defeat Horus. I have to beat Horus. That's the priority. He says, no, it doesn't matter. That's important, but this is not the way to do it. The cost is too great. What happens after you beat Horus? What then? Will you just take more power and more power and more power as newer and newer threats keep coming? You need to stop yourself. Now, I won't spoil how it is Olanius gets through to his old friend, but what he eventually does get him to do is give up the power. The Emperor willingly relinquishes the power of a god on the brink of apotheosis. The eggshell around him cracks and explodes in a flash of power. And left standing there is the Emperor as he was, golden and resplendent, with Kaikaltus Dusk healed from the brink of death. Olanius, John, Litu, and Garvia Loken, because Garvia Loken was here, also all brought back to normal vitality. And the person watching all of this with the most to say on the matter is actually Malkador the Sigilite of all people, with his perspective from the throne. He sees what his old friend is becoming and it horrifies him, saying this is the one thing they didn't predict as a possibility. The Emperor being undone by his own hand. Him going too far and taking up too much power. You see, the Emperor knew about the Dark King theory. Specifically, it is a prophecy that actually predates human civilization, and I think the human race as a whole. However, the Emperor and Malkador basically dismissed it out of hand as more superstitious hoo-ha that it doesn't really mean anything, it's one of a billion other prophecies about the end of the galaxy, whatever have you. But as Horus became more and more powerful towards the end of the siege, and his name began to appear across Terra, they suddenly had to take it seriously, and accept the fact that, oh no, Horus might ascend to become the Dark King. However, they didn't see this coming. And I'm gonna be honest, it's a little bit unclear if it was meant to be Horus, but the stoppage of time confounded fate, as Armin says, and then it became the Emperor, or if it was the Chaos God's ultimate goal to have the Emperor become the Dark King all along. Because it's stated that when the Emperor becomes the Dark King, all of humanity will be consumed, and the warp will boil for millions of years, basically ending the material galaxy. Now, it should be noted that in the book Master of Mankind, the Emperor does comment that if humanity meets the same fate as the Eldari, it would be far worse and spell the end of the galaxy. However, he doesn't say so in the context of the Dark King. He sort of just says it as a potential possibility that could happen at some point in the future if he doesn't intervene, because that's apparently the fate of all sentient psi-active races. Some people take this to mean that he predicted the coming of the Dark King, but no, it doesn't really seem like it. He just knew it was a possibility at some point. So, how does he avoid the coming of the Dark King, for now at least? And how does Starchild factor into all this? Well, when the Emperor aboard the Vengeful Spirit, well, I should note, it's not really the Vengeful Spirit anymore, it's something called the Inevitable City, which is a mixture of the Vengeful Spirit, Terra, and the Warp itself, runs into Alanius Pius Person, who gets him to give up the power. And when he does, Malkador the Sigilite comments on how he has given up the power and why he has done it. Because the Dark King would have won this day, but lost everything ever after. And we learn some very important things from Malkador's perspective on the Golden Throne, at this point. For starters being, when the Emperor banishes the Dark King within himself, and the eggshell around him crumbles without hatching, Malkador comments the Dark King has been defeated for this age at least. Meaning, the prophecy still holds sway and the Dark King may yet rise in the future. It's just for now the crisis has been averted. So, we shouldn't count out the Dark King just yet, and us lore theorists, we are not going to, you better believe me. 
However, one thing even more interesting is what the Emperor does alongside banishing the Dark King, that being banishing part of his own soul. As Malkador puts it, he has amputated that portion of himself which contains almost all of his hope, loyalty, and compassion. For such things shall become a hindrance when he faces the Lupacal. Those qualities might make him stay his hand, or hesitate if he is ultimately obliged to kill. And if he is ultimately obliged to kill his son, then those qualities would thereafter inevitably drive him to self-hatred and regret, and condemn him to the same embittered path as Horus. He has excised those precious human aspects to further steel himself against the pain of what will come after, and the mandatory atrocities he will have to countenance in order to rebuild the Imperium. He has set those frail and cardinal virtues adrift in the Imperium, so that they shall not immobilize him when the time comes, and in the hope that one day he will be able to reclaim them and be whole again. I watch that jettisoned fragment as it drifts into the void, just one more spark from this world bonfire. All his hope, his mercy, his grace, his love, passed into the lightless tracts of space and time. That fragile asterism, as cosmic ages turn, slowly grow by a coalescence of emotion and belief, just as the powers of chaos grow. It luminesces briefly, just a hermetic spark among the pinprick lights of the Milky Way galaxy, like an infant sun or a child star, and then it is gone and lost from view. I am profoundly struck by his sacrifice. I would weep if I could. I would weep for my friend. He has done what is necessary for the future and for this atemporal moment. It is after this moment that Malkador comments the Emperor now looks hardened and steeled for the task at hand, more ready now than he has ever been. So I'm kind of wondering where the whole Alanius Pius thing will come into play. I'm sorry, Alanius Pius is just a very interesting thing. I have a whole video on it. But if he's exercised himself of emotion, how is that whole thing going to happen where someone steps in the way to stop Horus and then Horus kills him, then the Emperor says, oh, you can't do that and blah, and then just blows him up. But like, I don't think it'll happen that way. A lot of things have changed, but still though, I'm wondering where they're going to go from that. If the Emperor is just a thinking, unfeeling machine, He's either going to kill Horus or he won't. Okay, putting that little tangent aside just now, you can see why this is such a big deal. This is exactly what the Star Child was described to be back in those books in the 1990s. All of his compassion and love and humanity cast aside so that he can kill Horus. Also, it should be noted that when the thing is flying away, that spark of his spirit, Malkador literally says, it looks like an infant sun or a quote-unquote child star. Child star? Really, Dan Abnett? Really, man? Yeah, it's pretty obvious that that's what that is. It's Star Child. And we know this because Star Child has been appearing in some of the recent lore relevant books, namely the Adon of Fire series, namely the books Throne of Light and A Martyr's Tomb, which deal a lot with faith and the ecclesiarchy. Specifically, in Throne of Light, there are visions ever since the Psychic Awakening that occurred in the wake of the opening of the Great Rift, because for those who don't know, after the Great Rift opened across the galaxy with the fall of Cadia, humans everywhere experienced an uptick in psychic ability, more psychers began appearing, and more powerful ones at that. And people began experiencing visions, both on astropathic relays, in their dreams, in visions, all kinds of ways, of a golden infant and a radiant being of light rising up from a throne, which caused upheaval on a lot of imperial worlds, and actually caused a lot of problems for the Tau Empire, as humans within their ranks had a resurgence of faith and began to rebel against their Tau allies. Now, I'm gonna be honest, all the information I have on this is from the Lexicanum and whatever excerpts I can see people sharing around on the internet, because I haven't read any of the Adana Fire books as of yet, unfortunately. And honestly, I genuinely don't know if I'll get to it for a long time, because I've been so consumed with catching up on the Horus Heresy and making sure I'm up to date with that as we reach the final book in the Siege of Terra. I want to read the Dark Imperium series. I want to read the Fabius Bile books. I want to read any books with Call in them, because those are just a little more interesting to me. Like, maybe I'll just try reading Throne of Light and A Martyr's Tomb just for the Star Child stuff, 
because I'm just not that interested in the rest of it. I still have to read Lion, Son of the Forest as well, shit. I'm behind, is what I'm saying. I'm just behind on a lot of reading right now. But that aside, I think I've made my point. Starchild is back. It is the Emperor's compassion and his true humanity taken out of his body and sent adrift. That's also part of the reason in my mind why when Gilliman talks to the Emperor after being resurrected, the Emperor is so cold and unpleasant and inhuman. He is a menacing presence who says things to Gilliman like, Failure, traitor, tool, 13th, my last hope, things like that. And then he realizes the Emperor isn't viewing him as a son, but more as a tool to use as his way out of this horrible state and this horrible situation. Gilliman describes it as the Emperor's mask effectively having slipped over all this time and after everything that's happened, but in reality he couldn't have known about this, and Gilliman didn't spend all that much time with the Emperor, because the Emperor did, as Malkador states, undergo a change. His exposure to the Primarchs made him more human. He grew as a person out of contact with them, because as Malkador says, even fathers can learn from their sons. All Gilliman was really exposed to was the Emperor maybe in the earlier stages of the Great Crusade, back when he was a much colder and more utilitarian person who still viewed his sons as tools. Because you have to remember, Gilliman was off on his own most of the time because he had his own mini-empire. And now the real question, where does this go theory-wise? Because, as you know, I have released a video a while ago that did quite well, called Gods of Order and Anti-Warp, which details the Emperor's rise as a possible god of order due to his contrasting nature to the Chaos Gods, and his growing power. How does this fit into the God of Order theory? Well, in my mind, it would have to involve the Emperor's mortal body staying alive, some people think his mortal body would have to die, and being reunited with the Star Child bringing back that compassion and human empathy that has grown and metastasized because of belief and worship, with the mortal form people worship physically, because he is praised as he on Terra or he on the throne. There's a dual worship here, because while people pray to the Emperor for protection and for guidance and influence, they also worship him in a physical sense, because a lot of the Imperial faith is predicated on the Emperor suffering upon the throne for mankind. I've actually likened this to the Christian Trinity, because you see, there is the Emperor who launched the Great Crusade, God the Father, the Emperor who sits upon the throne and suffers, God the Son, and the Emperor who protects, aka Starchild, who is God the Holy Spirit. So I believe bringing together Starchild and the Emperor on the throne is what would facilitate his true ascension as a proper god, namely a god of order as opposed to the Dark King. And going with that vein, where does the Dark King fit into this? Because it is stated that he is banished for this era at least. Now, I don't think he's going to appear immediately that suddenly he's going to pop up as this big plot point. Ooh, the Dark King's going to come. Ooh, when's he going to come? No, I think if we ever do see the Dark King again, it will be far away, probably years from now, when new plot points have been introduced, new characters, new threads, and the setting has evolved thoroughly, possibly even into a Warhammer 50k, which some people do theorize would happen. Because, one thing that has to be noted is that after the Emperor gives up the power of the Dark King, and cuts the prophecy off, or at least delays it for however long, people start reading tarot cards again. Every time people would read tarot cards on Terra, the last one to show up would be the Dark King, right after the Emperor. However, now it is changed to the Emperor and then the Despoiler, showing Abaddon's ascendancy to become the new big threat. This is actually something that is touched on by Zardu Laic, who has died in the earlier Siege of Terra and was a very powerful word bearer. He said to Abaddon repeatedly, Horus is actually going to fail just so you know, and it's you who's going to rise. The Chaos Gods have their eyes on you. They like you. But Abaddon is markedly different. He rejects the worship of Chaos and rejects much of the power and gifts he could absolutely get from the Pantheon, and as such has kept in control of himself and much of the Black Legion. He's a very different beast from his father, and I believe he would never become the Dark King. It's just not him, barring some massive change to his character, which would probably suck. So, to recap it all, the Dark King is banished for now, but he does still exist, and the prophecy still holds sway in some ways. We see now the beginning of Starchild, coupled with the Adana Firebooks that have been mentioning it lately, and the Emperor is now headed towards his final confrontation with Horus, which he is entirely unsure he will win all without any of his human empathy, love, or compassion inside him. And while everyone was focusing on the Dark King, my big focus was Starchild and what that really means for the setting going forward, especially the Emperor's Godhood. 
But what do you guys think? Do you guys really believe this is the resurgence of a Star Child plotline or more or less us just being teased? Do you think it's a good idea or do you think it will suck? How do you feel about the whole Dark King storyline and how it was handled, if you've read the book? I actually don't think it was handled that well, but that's a discussion for another time. Now, I've been pretty busy with class and I'm going to be busy for a little while after, but I would love to get to the full video, probably more than an hour long, detailing all my thoughts on the end of the death volume 2 and what I think will happen going into volume 3, because volume 2, despite all its flaws, was absolutely a curveball from what I predicted at the end of the end of the death volume 1. That little sentence took me several attempts to record. I'd love to hear what you guys have to say in the comments below, and please subscribe if you have not already done so, but until then I will see you in the next video.